Amen. All right, so here in James chapter 2, you know, James 2 is probably one of the most misunderstood, mistaught chapters in the whole Bible. People like to use it to try to teach a work salvation, or a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people that will say, well, salvation was a free gift, but now you have to work to keep salvation, which is kind of dumb. But, you know, they use James 2 to try to back this up. And, you know, first of all, James is at the end of the Bible. In the beginning, of the, you have the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those are clearly for salvation. They teach very clear, thorough salvation doctrine by faith alone. Even in Acts and Romans, you see the same things being confirmed all the way through the epistles. And by the time you get to the end of the Bible, when you get to 1 John and James and Peter, when somebody uses a verse out of there to try to tell you you have to turn over a new leaf or you have to have good works for salvation, listen, those books are written to people that are already saved and it's instructing them on how to be a good Christian. Right? In fact, the whole, the whole book of James itself is really about how to have good religion, if you will. How to tame your tongue. You know, how you ought to pray for each other. How you ought to forgive each other. The whole book, if you just look at James as an overview, you see that. But yet, they would say, well, James 2 sticks out like this sore thumb. Like, oh, well, there it's clearly teaching works. That's wrong. That's a lie. And what I want to help you this morning, in the simplest way, help you to be able to understand James 2. And also be able to defend it. Because James 2, my first point is that James 2 teaches salvation by faith alone just in that chapter. Now, I'm going to give you my four points in advance. James 2 teaches salvation of the soul by faith alone will be point number one. Point number two will be that James 2 teaches you can save your flesh from judgment by works. Right? If you obey God's Word, He will not correct you. If you disobey God's Word, He will chastise you. That's the second point. And my third point will be that James 2 agrees with the rest of the Bible on spiritual salvation. Okay? And, and the last point will be the purpose of James 2. Why does it, what's the purpose of the James, James essentially and especially James 2? It is for the profit of others and it is for perfection through obedience, for becoming a better person. So my first point is that James 2 teaches salvation by faith alone. Look at verse number one. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. So here, you know, in James 1, he starts out by saying, he talks about the trying of our faith. Again, written to save people. Your faith will be tried. You're going to be tested. This is how you grow when you come through temptation, James 1 talks about. So when he gets to 2, he's talking about, okay, to a saved person, you shouldn't be a respecter of persons. Well, I like you better than I like you. Or, hey, come sit up here and you go sit back there, right? I should demonstrate the love of Christ and you know treat everybody equally. I shouldn't be a respecter of persons. God is not, and neither should we be. But more importantly, you know, again, written to the saved, it's how to live. Look at verse number five. This is very key. Look at verse number five. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom? That's heaven which hath promised to them that love Him. This is talking about saved people. Yeah. James chapter 2, verse number 5, people that are rich in faith, they're saved. I want you to turn to Romans 4. I'm going to compare something. So when he says rich in faith, you know, we had just read a couple weeks ago in 2 Peter 1 where he talks about precious faith. Right? You're rich in faith if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have precious faith in God's eyes. You're already saved. When he says heirs of the kingdom here in James 2, 5, you know, it makes me think of where he says, Come, ye blessed my Father, inherit the kingdom. Right? We will one day inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's been prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Right. He says, Heirs of the kingdom which He hath promised to them that love Him. Right? Well, God has made us many promises. And salvation is one of the biggest. He says, um, in James 1, He says, He shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised them that love Him. You will have everlasting life if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I mean, in this one verse alone, there's several things that you, you cannot deny, you cannot overlook. It's talking about salvation by faith alone. And even the love aspect where he talks about loving Him. In, John 1, in 1 John 4, he says, we love Him because He first loved us. I'm so thankful that He's forgiven my sins. I'm so thankful that He loved me enough to come into the world, die for my sins, go to hell so I don't have to. I love that fact. 
Because I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to have to answer for my own sin. But James 2 is dealing with now that you're saved, you need to act like a Christian. You need to grow like a Christian or God will correct you. Look, you're in Romans 4.13. Romans 4, verse number 13. He says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. We are righteous by our faith. Look at the next verse. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Go back to James 2. So, those that have faith are saved. You're going to heaven. That's a promise that He's made. And you clearly see all of those things right there in verse number 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which He hath promised to them that love Him. So, point number one, James 2 clearly teaches salvation by faith alone without anything else. That verse alone should prove to you the context of of what this chapter is talking about. Now the second point I have is that James 2 teaches you can save or prevent your flesh from being corrected by God by obeying His Word. By doing the good works that He wants you to do. By living a righteous life that will prevent God from correcting you, from chastising you. Just as much as every one of you in here with a child, if you tell your child do something and they refuse to do it, you should spank them. You should correct them. The child can save their flesh from a spanking if they would only obey. If they would only obey. In Hebrews 12, he says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you are a son of God, if you are a daughter of God, if you are a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, God will correct you when you disobey. In Hebrews 12, is just a few chapters. It goes Hebrews and then James. Hebrews ends with 13. We're in chapter 2. So it's really, it's not, it shouldn't be that big of a surprise and people shouldn't look at James 2 like it's way out of context when Hebrews 12 is talking about correction. That chapter is known for teaching correction. Look, you're in James 2. And I want you to keep a finger in James 2. We're going to go to several places this morning, but we're going to keep coming back to James 2. Look at verse number 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Right? We know in, in Romans 3, he says there are none righteous, no, not one. Right? He says, if you offend in one point, well, what's one point? What's one percentile? Right? If you deduct that, you have 99%. Is a 99 perfect? No, it's not. If you miss one point on a test, it is not a perfect grade. And God's trying to emphasize this here. Hey, we've all come short of the glory of God. We have all missed the mark. We have all sinned. We, there are none righteous. No, not one. I am not good enough to get to heaven on my own. That's why we need God. And He's instructing us here about our lifestyle. Because we're all guilty, we all need the forgiveness of God. We all need the mercy of God. And without God's mercy, we have nothing. We can't do it on our own. So now that we're saved, what should your lifestyle be? Somebody that believes God when He says, I will correct you. Yeah. Right? Somebody that believes God when He says, if you do good, I'll bless you. If you do evil, I will curse you. Right. You have to believe that and act it out. Live like that. Look at verse number 12. He says, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. All right, the law of liberty is the Bible. There is a law that will set you at liberty. That's God's holy word. Amen. And what He's saying is, speak and do. That's your walk and your talk. As somebody that's going to be judged by the Bible, knowing that God has things that you ought to do, do it. Obey it. Now again, this is not saying to get to heaven you have to keep every commandment because frankly that's impossible. Understanding the, the foundation he's building on here. In fact, you know, turn to James 1.25. It talks about this also. We need to be afraid of God. We need to be afraid of His judgment. We need to recognize the fact that if you live in sin, God will judge you if you're, a, if you're a child of God. James 1.25 But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Read the Bible. Do what it says. 
And God will bless you, right? Versus what? You read it, you don't do it. What happens? You get corrected. You have a curse on your life. God shows you your sin through the Scriptures. You hear it, and you say, well, will I obey? Do you want a blessing from God? You know, in Revelation 1, He says, Blessed is he that readeth, and heareth the words of this prophecy, and keep the things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. When you hear the Bible, if you obey what it says, God will bless you. Plain and simple. This is the whole emphasis of James chapter 2. There's a blessing for obeying. There's chastisement for disobedience. Look at James 1.22. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Right? How, I mean, because there's a lot of Christians that would say, well, I'm saved. I get it. I got it. It's okay. I can go walk with the world. I can go talk like the world. I can go the places that the world goes and it won't hurt me because I'm already saved. They can't get my soul. Yeah, but they're going to vex your whole life. They're going to just pollute your mind. They're going to cause your flesh to be corrected by God by causing you to walk down that path. And it's our choice every day, moment by moment. Will we obey? God's given us His Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into truth. And when something comes up into your mind, when something comes up to try to draw you away from God, you have a choice. Will I hearken to the voice of the Lord? Will I obey the commandment of the Scripture? Or will I just take a beating? Will I take that whooping? Well, I know God's going to really put a curse on my life. But you know, I enjoy this sin. You think about it. I, mean, I wish that we would see it like that. I wish we would recognize why we don't get the blessings we want sometimes. is because we're following the world. We're trying to get the now instead of what God has for us spiritually. Look, Go back to James 2. Look at verse number 13. It says, For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Right? If I'm found guilty and, I, and, and I'm not convicted, well then that's mercy. Right? Judgment rejoiceth against mercy. You're found guilty, they let you go, that's mercy. Right? But the first part here when he says, he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. If you don't show mercy to other people, then God won't show you mercy. This is dealing with, as a Christian, how you should deal with your brother. Right? We shouldn't be a respecter of persons. If I have an opportunity and, and judgment is in my hand, and I say, you know what, I'm not going to give this guy any mercy. I'm going to come down hard. Well, what's God going to do to me? I will have judgment without mercy. God will not be merciful to me when I need it. God's trying to instruct us on how to Follow the, the law of liberty. It reminds me in Luke 6 where he says, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Listen, condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. If you can't forgive your brother, how dare you go to God saying, God, forgive me. Right? God's teaching us a principle here. The more you forgive others, the more He will forgive you. And it's very simple. Look, look at verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren... Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? This is the phrase, this is the question that everybody stumbles on in James 2. Can faith save him? Now listen, can faith save your soul from hell? Yes, if your faith is placed on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone and none of your works. But that's not what's being taught here. This isn't what the question is asking. The verse before is talking about judgment, being judged being condemned and he says if you just have faith can that save you from condemnation can it save you from judgment you think about this if your son disobeys you and you say I'm gonna correct you and he says but dad I believe you're my father you're gonna say "Oh, okay you're good to go no whooping no your faith can't save you from correction in this instance right your actions have to save you you have to, okay, Dad, I'm sorry. You're right. I got it wrong. I want to do it right. Let me quickly go do what you've said. And then the relationship is restored. Then, hey, there may still be some correction, but God may show some mercy. What he's saying here is, does faith alone prevent you from being corrected from God? No. you got to do something to keep from being corrected of God. You have to obey what you hear. So this hard phrase, this difficult phrase, can faith save him? It's talking about correction of the flesh. And the answer is, Works can save your flesh from being corrected. This is what this whole dialogue is about here. 
in James 4, he says there is, go to James 5. I want you to turn to James 5. In James 4, he says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. If God wants to destroy your body, He can. If God wants to save your body and prevent you from death, God has that ability. You're in James chapter 5. Look at verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. You hear that? Yep. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So here it says, faith shall save. But again, is this referring to the flesh or the soul? It's talking about the flesh. Just as much as in James when he says, hey, do you, have, do you want wisdom? Do you lack wisdom? Ask God in faith, believing He'll give it to you. Right? It's teaching to pray in faith. It's teaching to walk in faith. So here, when he gets to it, he's like, if you're sick, do you believe God can heal you? Are you asking out of faith that God has that power to heal you? And in this, I mean, I love this, this passage because this is relevant to our church. This is relevant to the things that have happened in our church. And I want to be, you know, it says, if he had committed sins. Listen, when somebody's sick, it's not always because they've committed sins. Sometimes it's just for the glory of God. Sometimes it's to prevent you from going down a path you don't need to. You think about Brother Garrett Kirchway, his, his testimony, how he was going to go out of the country and it all fell through and it didn't work. But that was God working for the, for the salvation of the flesh of his babies. Because of what happened with his children, God worked in a miraculous way. Take a few steps back to James 5.12. He says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay be yea, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. He's saying, don't swear. You, if you say yes, make it a yes. You need to fulfill your oath. Otherwise, you'll fall into condemnation. Otherwise, you'll be judged. Otherwise, hey, you might be that guy that gets sick because you've disobeyed God, because you're lying. You break the law, God will judge you in the flesh. Look at verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith, I'm sorry, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So here God in trying to instruct us in faith is telling us, you know, when you have something wrong, get it right. If there's something wrong in the flesh, do you believe God can heal you? Or do you want to go to the doctor? Which physician would you rather seek after? Now go back to James 2. It reminds me of 1 John 1, 9 where he says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Another verse that people will look at and say, well, I have to ask for forgiveness every night or I might go to hell. There's a lot of people I ran into out soul winning that would say that. Why? Well, all I know is every night before I lay my head down on that pillow, I'm asking God, I'm sorry for what I did. As soon as I wake up, I say, yeah, but what happens if you die before that? I guess I'd go to hell. Well, then you don't have salvation. As a Christian, you want to be forgiven of God, you should confess your faults to it. Lord, I'm sorry, I messed up again. Lord, help me. Please show me mercy. Help me to show others mercy. Again, the end of the Bible, James, John, Peter, these books were written to Christians on how to live their life, not how to become a Christian. That's where everybody gets it wrong. So this is teaching that works prevent correction and judgment of God. Look at James 2, verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. Now wait, are these fleshly needs or spiritual needs? They're fleshly. He's driving this point home. What's the salvation he's talking about here? Saving the body. Look at verse 16. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Right? You want to be profitable to somebody? Help them when they need help. What are you doing for dinner? Uh, I'm just going home. I, come on, come with us. I can't, I can't afford it. If you got a few extra bucks, be a blessing to that person. Amen. Hey, I got you. Don't be filled, brother. 
Oh, go, well, you go home and be filled. No, come with us and be filled. Let me buy you a hamburger. You know what I mean? Show some Christianity. Look, he says, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead. Now, what it's not saying here is that salvation in the Lord won't say. You know, and this is where people really like to confuse the whole thing. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. So what's happening here, he's teaching that because you have faith, you know how powerful God is, you know what He wants you to do, you ought to do what He says. Right? He's not saying you're going to lose your salvation if you don't do the works. What He's saying is, you want to see how big my faith is? I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Right? Well, I've only got 10 bucks and, and I'm going to buy this guy a burger. Hey, I have faith God will give me another 10 bucks. I'm going to buy that guy a burger. Right? I have faith that God will replenish. If I do the right thing, God will bless me. That ought to be your attitude and not that of fear. Oh no, i got to hold on to that last five bucks. I can't give it to my brother. Well, your brother doesn't even have five bucks. Yeah. Share with him. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's trying to teach us on how not to be a respecter of persons, how to love our brethren, how to live like a Christian. And the big question is here is how do you answer it when somebody says that faith without works is <laughs> dead? Now, my, my, we're on point number three here. First point was James 2 teaches salvation of the soul is faith alone. Remember that? Verse number five. James 2 teaches you can save your flesh from judgment by good works. Our third point is James 2 agrees with the rest of the Bible on spiritual salvation. Now you guys have probably heard of that, that one-two punch, right? I'm going to teach you the 246 knockout. All right? I want you to remember this. When somebody says, yeah, but you know, faith without works is dead, say, let me show you the 246 knockout. Come here, let me show you this, right? Start in Ephesians chapter 2 where you guys are at. Look at verse number 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's a gift something you have to buy. It's a gift something you have to pay to maintain, to keep. No. no. It should be a no-brainer. Look at the next verse. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't work to save your soul. The only thing you can do is trust that Jesus finished the works, that He's offering you this gift, and say, yeah, I want that gift. Give it here. I'll take it. He's made a promise. Do you want the gift? If you take it, you'll never lose the gift. Now, where do works come into play? The next verse. Look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now that we're His workmanship, now that we're saved by faith alone, now that we've taken that free gift, God says you should walk in, in good works. God says you should go do those. You should open your mouth. You should go preach the Gospel. You should try to live like a Christian. Once you're saved, show those good works. Glorify your Father in Heaven by your good works. That's the whole point of that. Now, turn to Romans chapter 4. The 2, 4, 6 knockout. Remember in James 2, he says, uh, that faith without works is dead. And they'll say, well, well, Abraham our father was justified by works. And we're going to get deeper into that. Acts 13.39, it says, And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. It's either all law or it's all faith. Right? It's either all works or it's all grace. Yeah. You can't have both. You can't mix it. And that's where Peter... And hey, there was one person that, that did it by the law. There was one person that did it by works. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the man Jesus died for my sins and went to hell so I don't have to go. I'm thankful. I trust in that alone. I can't put any trust in myself. Amen. But because I believe that, now I want to live like a Christian. I want to please Him. He's done a lot for me. I love Him. Look at Romans 4, verse number 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Right? Remember we just read about glorying. Hey, it, glorying would be me coming to the door and saying, hey, let me tell you how to go to heaven. Look, I, I turned over a new leaf, and I quit doing this, and I quit going to the bars, and I quit running around. It's like, 
I'm telling you what I did. I'm glorying of my own works. I'm not telling you what Jesus Christ did. And those people that use that method of evangelism, they're, most of them are probably not even saved. There are some people that use it that are saved. They've been taken down the wrong path and taught the wrong thing. And it's foolishness because it's not a biblical pattern. The Bible is, let me open up my mouth and tell you what Jesus did for you. And for me, I don't have to tell you what I did wrong. We're all found guilty. We're all sinners. We all need a Savior. We all need mercy. So he says, pertaining to the flesh, dealing with works that are visible to men. Look what he says. Hey, you want to bring your works to God? Not your filthy rags, it calls it. God, look, I got this dirty rag here. Will you let me into heaven? He doesn't want that. He wants your heart. Look at verse number 3. For what saith the Scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Right? Remember, there are none righteous, no, not one, it says in Romans 3. Romans 10 says that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Amen. So it's only through the soul you can become righteous. Your flesh will never stop sinning. Verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Right? If, if somebody mows my lawn for me, it's a debt. It's not a gift. Oh, thanks for mowing my lawn. Let me give you a $20 gift. He's going to say, no, why don't you give me that $30 you owe me for doing the work? You know what I'm saying? It's not a gift. It's a debt. You owe it to him. But to, look at verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. How do we become righteous in God's sight? How do we get into heaven? By trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That and that alone. Romans 4 is such a solid passage that squashes this perverted view of James 2 in so many ways. We've already been there once and we'll probably be back again later. But look, look at verse number 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. If you never do anything good you can still go to heaven because frankly you've already done enough bad right and you're forgiven for all those things you're forgiven for everything in your past and in your future you don't have to try to balance the scales and that's where everybody has it wrong turn to hebrews chapter 6 the 2 4 6 knockout ephesians 2 romans 4 hebrews chapter 6 as you're turning there i'm going to read you john 1 12 but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of god even to them that believe on his name you want to receive God, you want to receive Jesus, you believe on His name, and then you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Right. In James 1, he says, Receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your souls. Receive with meekness, humbly coming to God. I'll receive the Word. I'll receive this testimony. I want the testimony. I want to believe. Look, you're in Hebrews 6, verse number 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Do you hear what it just said there? Dead works. Now what does James talk about? Dead faith. So you have dead faith and dead works. If you're saved and you don't do any works, the Bible is saying your faith is dead. If you're unsaved, but you have good works, those works are dead works. They will not get you into heaven. In context here, he's saying repentance from dead works. Before I was saved, I was trusting in my own works to get me to heaven. I have to repent of that. I have to turn from trusting in my works and turn to what? It says in faith toward God. How did I get saved? By my faith. What was my repentance? Was it turning over a new leaf and living a new lifestyle? No. It's what I was trusting in. I was trusting in works. Those were dead. Now, I'm putting my trust and my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So when somebody says, well, dead faith, hey, what about dead works, buddy? Right? If you're trusting in those works, you probably have dead works. You probably have no faith. Think about that. So that's the two, three, the, the, the two, four, six punch out, knock out, right? Works without faith is dead. We got to repent of trusting in our works. Turn back to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. So when, some, when it says dead faith, what it's talking about is a Christian that's not growing. Somebody, their faith is not growing, right? Their lifestyle hasn't changed. Hey, you're saved. Your soul's going to go to heaven. 
right? And that's where people get mixed up usually. Those that are trying to work their way to heaven, they, they gauge things by their body. Well, I haven't been that bad. Well, I'm trying to get rid of this habit or that habit. I'm trying to stop saying this word or that word. Okay, that's all in the flesh. Your flesh will not go to heaven. It's only your soul. To have your soul sealed unto the day of redemption, you have to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where people get mixed up. They're, they're thinking of the flesh instead of the soul. So the, the faith that James 2 is talking about is now that you have faith, now that you're saved, that won't keep you from a whooping from your daddy. All right, yeah. you got to obey him. You better do the works or God's going to come down on you. He's going to correct you for disobeying his word. So point number one was that James 2 teaches salvation by faith alone for the soul. Point number two was that you can save your flesh from judgment by good works. Point number three is that James 2 agrees with the rest of the Bible on spiritual salvation. If we wanted to, if we had time, we could read a hundred verses through James or, or through John that would just faith, believe, ever, everlasting life. It lasts forever. You know, we could read all those. Most of you already know them. The last point is that our purpose, the purpose of James 2 for us, what we need to glean from it, is that we should profit others by our works and that we should become perfect through obedience. We should grow and, and, and actually have some perfection as a Christian. You're in James 2. Look at verse number 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he hath offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? So do you want your faith to be made perfect in God's eyes? Then you need to add some works to it. Now that doesn't negate, that doesn't take away your salvation, right? No man will pluck him out of his hand. He's made a promise. He cannot lie. He will not go back on his word. Salvation is forever. But for God to say, hey, this guy's growing in perfection. He's getting closer to the goal. You need to add the works to it. And notice it doesn't say that in verse 22, he says, see us how faith wrought with his works. It doesn't say faith wrought works. It doesn't say, well, if you believe, you're really going to have the works, right? It's saying, now that you really believe, you really should have some works too. You really should add some of these works to you. A lot of people, again, they twist a lot of this. I want to take a look here. We're going to take a look at the timeline of Abraham. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter number 12. Because in this point, he gives us Abraham as an example of a man that had faith that saved his soul and then he obeyed and his obedience perfected his faith. His faith was good enough to get him to heaven. His works were good enough to get him as a righteous where God said, hey, I like this guy. I want to talk about him in the Bible. I want others to learn from him. Right? His works made it where he was a good example for us to learn from. Faith combined with his works perfected his faith. And it was just an outward sign. It was the works that people saw so that they would learn from Him. Genesis 12, I want you to look at verse number 4. It says, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So here we are, Genesis 12. He's seventy-five years old. What I want to do is show you the timeline. We're just going to skim a couple verses here in Genesis and show you how much time passed from the time that he had faith that saved his soul to the time he had works that perfected his faith. Turn to Genesis 15. So it says that he was 75. Genesis 15, verse number 6. It says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. At this point, you can without a doubt say that Abraham is saved. Now there are other things you can point to behind this, but this is clear. This is crystal clear. This is referenced in so many other passages in the Bible. Right? He's saved by his faith for sure. And he's 75 years old. Turn to the next chapter. Chapter 16, verse number 3. It says, And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar her maid the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. 
And he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So here it's saying, 10 years later, after he has believed and been saved, we have what happens with Hagar. Look at verse 16 in this chapter. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. So here we are 11 years later. He was 75. Ten years later, he takes Hagar. In the process of time, she has that baby. He's 86 years old when Ishmael is born. Turn to chapter 17, verse number 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now look, we're talking about perfecting his faith. God's instructing him. How do you, how do you perfect your, your faith? Obey him. Walk before him. Right? He, so he's 99 at this point. Look at verse 24 in this chapter. And Abram was 90 years old and nine when he circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So, alright, math geniuses. What's 99 minus 86? 24, 15. How about 13? It gave us the answer. It was a trick question. It was a trick question. It's right there, right? It's 13 years. So we had 10 years. Then we have 13 years, right? Or 11 years and 13 years. Now look at verse 21. This is key. So we're at. We're up to... Where are we at? Help me out, math guy. Where are we at? He's like, oh, wait, are you preaching? <laughs> we're in church. No, I'm just kidding. Look, 13... Plus the 11, how much is that? 24. Look at verse 21, Genesis 17, 21. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So 24 plus one year is how many years? 25. So we are 25 years down the road. He has been saved for 25 years, and God is saying, I want you to make your faith perfect. I want you to walk in my ways. I want you to obey what my commandment I'm going to give you. Does that make sense? So he's been saved for 25 years. He hasn't done any work. I mean, he's done some works, but God hasn't said these works save you at any point. He comes to the point, he says, now let's, let's grow. Let's get perfect. Look at Genesis 22. This is the reference that James 2 references. Genesis 22. Verse number 2. And he said, Take now thy son... Thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon the mountains which I will tell, tell thee of. Right? So Genesis 22, look at verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. So he calls him a lad. Notice that. Look at the next verse. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both them together. Now this lad was strong enough to carry an armload of wood. Right? Now we don't have an exact age, but he's given us some very key insight here. It's already 25 years plus however old this lad is that's strong enough to carry a bundle of wood. Right? I mean, so he couldn't be less than 10, I don't believe. I believe he's older than 10. Let's keep reading. And Abraham said, verse I'm sorry, verse uh, 7 and Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, here, I, here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now go back to Romans 4. So here he's reasoning. He's intelligent enough to see what's going on. He's intelligent enough to be looking for the next step. Oh, wait, I got the wood. You got the knife. You got the fire. If we're doing an offering, we've got to have that lamb, right? I mean, the kid's smart enough to see the future. He's not just oblivious walking around. He's strong enough to be carrying wood, right? So, is it possible that this guy was 
15 years, 20 years, 30 years, yeah, I think anywhere in that range is a safe assumption. So I would say that somewhere between 40, 50, or 60 years later is what's referenced in James 2. Yeah. From the point that Abraham was for sure saved, according to Genesis 15, you can say at least 50 years later, we see him doing the works that perfect his faith. So, was it those works that saved his soul? No. They perfected the faith. You're in Romans 4. Before I read it, I want to just... In James 2, it said, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by faith... I'm sorry, by works was faith made perfect. So once he added those works 50 years later, his faith was made perfect. That's a long time. That is a long time. Hey, and as a Christian life, it may take you 50 years before you get to the point where God's like, now you're starting to mature. You know, <laughs> now you're starting to be perfected. That's good, you know? So, but you know, hey, you can set your goal a little bit. I wouldn't set it for 50 years. You know, I'd shoot a little bit smaller goal than that. Something obtainable. Like you're in Romans chapter 4, verse number 11. And he had received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. So he's saying Abraham circumcised everybody in his camp when he was... I'm sorry, let me back up. He said he received righteousness when he was not circumcised in the flesh. Look, he says that he might be the father of all them be that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them. Imputing is an accounting term. We're guilty, we're dirty, we're sinful. Jesus is perfect. He accounts His righteousness. He imputes our righteousness to our account. Look at verse 12. And the Father of circumcision, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith, our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. I don't know if you caught it when we read earlier. It was Ishmael was 13 years old when he circumcised. Right? So you could say for at least 14 years he had been saved and he points back and he says he was saved even before they circumcised the flesh. And he's bringing this up because there are people that would point, oh, you have to do that to be saved. You have to do that to be a Christian. And he's just, God debunks all of the works salvation verses or, or mentality. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. We're almost done here. Galatians chapter 3, look at verse number 2. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did you get God's Holy Spirit? Was it by keeping the law? No. It was by hearing about faith and believing it. Right? Having faith. Verse number 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. You guys remember that song, Father Abraham? You guys, I used to love that song. That was the best. You know it. <laughs> we, we should sing it, not now. <laughs> Let's get a professional up here. <laughs> so what he's saying is, Abraham was saved by his faith. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Hey, you're children of Abraham. You have that same faith as Abraham. You have that same promise that's been promised from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end. Look at verse 8 in the Scripture. Foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the Gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. He preached the Gospel to Abraham. He said, my son will come through your lineage one day. He's saying Jesus will come one day. That gospel was preached unto Abraham way back then. And Abraham said, I believe it. I'll take that. Because I know I can't get there. And God said, that's good. I'll account righteousness unto you even though you're still a sinner. He's forgiven. <coughs> verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. For it is evident the just shall live by faith. 
You're saved. You're justified from your sin. You should live righteously. But he's saying that you can't do good works to get to heaven. Right. No one can keep the law and then no one can keep the law enough especially to get to heaven. We're all found guilty here. And it's the same thing. It's about being justified in the sight. The works, sometimes when we do good works, it's to glorify God when other men see us. Well, he looks like a Christian. He's trying to live like a Christian. But yet, that flip side of the coin, there are people that try to live like a Christian and they are not trusting in Jesus alone. They're trusting in their own works. God says He'll reject them. He'll say, depart from Me. I never knew you. Look at verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We get the Holy Spirit by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn back to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Look at verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I want you to turn to Hebrews 11 and we're going to end here. So he's, he's giving us these examples. Abraham did the works. It pleased God, but it was his faith in God that actually saved his soul. It was his works that saved his body from being corrected. The salvation in James 2, not in verse 5, right? Verse 5 is the soul. And the rest of James 2 is saying, it'll save you from correction. It'll save you from judgment. Do you want mercy? Show mercy. Right? Obey God. Do the things He asks of you and He will be merciful unto you. And you're on your way to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter. And yet, all of Hebrews 11, one point after another is saying, look, they were saved by faith and they did good works. It still talks about how they did the works and God's bragging on those people because they did both. You know, the thief on the cross was saved just by his faith. But we don't even know his name. What, what did he do for God? We don't know. I don't know. It's okay. He's in heaven. It's alright. I'll get to know him one day. But the point is, God shows us examples of men in the Bible that because they believed God, because they were afraid of God, because they knew that judgment was coming, now that they're saved, they don't want to be corrected in the flesh. They want to please God. They want to do the work for Him while they're on the earth. God has promised us a reward for obeying Him. If you obey Him, He will reward you. He will bless your life. And there's no one in here that's so foolish that would say, I don't want God's blessing. I hope not anyway. Right? If there is, they're probably not saved. Because every one of you, if I asked you, do you want God's blessing on your life? You would say yes. But then here's the difficult part. Do what He says. Well, I do over here. Yeah, but what about over there? What about that thing that God's revealing to you? Are you doing that? Do you want all of the blessing? Or oh, just take a little bit of blessing. Don't be foolish. Receive what God has given us. Look at verse number 1 in Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right? Faith is the evidence. Not works. Faith is the evidence. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through their faith, they obtained a good report with God. Look at verse 17 in this chapter. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. He said, God's telling me to kill my son? Well, I know God can raise him right back up. Okay, God, whatever you say. I'll do whatever you say. I'm, I'm more afraid of you than I am of losing my very son. That's the point God wants us to get in our faith, is trusting him with everything. Asking him for everything for wisdom, for knowledge, for provision. How to talk to your brother. How to have wisdom to handle situations. God wants us to rely on Him. Having the faith that God wants to provide that. The bigger the faith we have that God will give us what we need, 
the more blessings we'll have in our life. Look at verse 29. And by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. And the Egyptians, a saying to do, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Notice what happened. They had faith. They compassed for seven days. They didn't just stand there on the side. Well, we have faith. Go ahead and do it. God says, you believe me? Do it. Right? Do you believe God wants to give you wisdom? Ask Him. Do you believe God wants to bless your life? Obey Him. And He will. Look at verse 31. By faith, the, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Remember it talked about her and James. How did she get saved? By her faith. So what did she do? She received the spies. Turn back to James 1 and, and we're, we'll be done right here. In that story of, of Rahab the harlot in the book of Joshua, she says, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. Right? She, she said the whole city was afraid. Her attitude, she said, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea from you when you came out of Egypt. Right? We know what you did. Then she names off these kings. We saw your victories. We heard of what's coming. We know that the God of heaven is with you and we're deathly afraid. And her attitude was, Well, I'm not going to fight that. I want to be on your side. I want to be on the side of the God that created everything, that can destroy anything, that judges and has mercy. You see, as soon as he had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more any courage in any man. She was afraid of God. She was afraid of the judgment of God. So she acted. She had faith. So she acted upon that. She says, because of you, for the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. We need to remember that. Hey, don't, don't just delegate heaven to God. He's, he's God down here too. He's got control over what you're dealing with. He's got control over your job. Will you give it to Him? Do you want His blessing there? Look at James 1.25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Do the work, God will bless you. Go to chapter 2. Verse 12. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Verse 22. See thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Add the good works and, and God will perfect you. You can you grow. Last verse, James 3, verse 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. That's my question to you today. Do you want to be a perfect man? Do you want to be a perfect woman? Do you want to get to that point when God looks down to you and be like, yeah, you're perfect. Now, does that mean you, you've never sinned again? No. Does that mean you got it all figured out? No. But your faith is perfect enough that God says He's relying on me. Enough that I don't care what He goes through, He knows to rely on me. That's the perfection of faith that God wants from us. The whole book of James is about how to be a better Christian. How to be stronger in your walk with God. Why we should have works to glorify God. And again, it clearly teaches salvation by faith alone. It clearly teaches that if you obey, you can save your flesh from the correction. And it, it agrees with the rest of the Bible. And the purpose of it is that we would profit others so they can see what God can do. And that it would perfect our own selves and we can be better Christians. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for James chapter 2. Although many people think it's confusing, Lord, I do believe that it's simple when we submit to You and we just take the attitude that salvation is by faith, so must it be in James 2. Lord, we know that Your Word is revealed through Your Holy Spirit. And I just pray that You would fill our church with people with the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to grow spiritually more than physically. Help us to grow spiritually more than financially. Lord, I pray that You would help us to all grow up into a perfect man. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.